Chapter the Sixteenth, How the Beast Folk Tasted Blood. But my inexperience as a writer betrays me, and I wander from the thread of my story. After I had breakfasted with Montgomery, he took me across the island to see the fumarole and the source of the hot spring who, into whose scalding waters I had blundered on the previous day. Both of us carried whips and loaded revolvers. While going through a leafy jungle on our road thither, we heard a rabbit squealing. We stopped and listened, but we heard no more, and presently we went on our way, and the incident dropped out of our minds. Montgomery called my attention to certain little pink animals with long hind legs that went leaping through the undergrowth. He told me they were creatures made of the offspring of the beast people that Moreau had invented. He had fancied they might serve for meat, but a rabbit-like habit of devouring their young had defeated this intention. I had already encountered some of these creatures once during my moonlight flight from the leopard man, and once during my pursuit by Moreau on the previous day. By chance, one hopping to avoid us leapt into the hole caused by the uprooting of a wind-blown tree. Before I could extricate it, before it could extricate itself, we managed to catch it. It spat like a cat, scratched and kicked vigorously with its hind legs, and made an attempt to bite, but its teeth were too feeble to inflict more than a painless pinch. It seemed to me rather a pretty little creature, and as Montgomery stated that it had ne that it never destroyed the turf by burrowing, and was more cleanly in its habits, I should imagine it might prove a convenient substitute for the common rabbit in gentlemen's parks. We also saw on our way the trunk of a tree barked in long strips and splintered deeply. Montgomery called my attention to this, not to claw bark of trees, that is the law. He said. Much some of them care for it. It was after this, I think, that we went that we met the satyr and the ape man. Satyr was a gleam of classical memory on the part of Moreau, his face ovine in expression like the coarser Hebrew type, his voice a harsh bleat, his nether extremities satanic. He was gnawing the husk of a pod like fruit as he passed us. Both of them saluted Montgomery. Hail, said they, to the other with the whip. There's a third with a whip now, said Montgomery, so you'd better mind. Was he not made, said the ape man? He said, he said he was made. The satyr man looked curiously at me. The third with the whip, he that walks sweeping into the sea, has a thin white face. He has a long, a thin, he has a thin long whip said Montgomery. Yesterday he bled and wept, said the satyr. You never bleed nor weep. The master does not bleed nor weep. Ollendorfian beggar, said Montgomery. You'll bleed and weep if you don't look out. He has five fingers. He is a five man like me, said the ape man. Come along, Prendick, said Montgomery, taking my arm, and I went on with him. The satyr and the ape man stood watching us and making other remarks to each other. He says nothing, said the satyr. Men have voices. Yesterday he asked me of things to eat, said the ape man. He did not know. Then they spoke inaudible things, and I heard the satyr laughing. It was on our way back that we came upon the dead rabbit. The red body of the wretched little beast was rent to pieces, many of the ribs stripped white and the backbone indisputably gnawed. At that, Montgomery stopped. Good God, said he, stooping down and picking up some of the crushed vertebrae to examine them more closely. Good God, he repeated. What can this mean? Some carnivore of yours has remembered his old habits, I said after a pause. This backbone has been bitten through. He stood staring with his face white and his lip pulled askew. I don't like this, he said slowly. I saw something of the same kind, said I, the first day I came here. The devil you did. What was it? A rabbit with its head twisted off. The day you came here? The day I came here, in the undergrowth at the back of the enclosure, when I came out in the evening. The head was completely wrung off. He gave a low whistle. 
and what is more, I have an idea which of your brutes did the thing. It's only a suspicion, you know. Before I came on the rabbit, I saw one of your monsters drinking in the stream. Sucking his drink? Yes. Not to suck your drink. That is the law. Much the brutes care for the law, eh? When Moreau's not about. It was the brute who chased me. Of course, said Montgomery. It's just the way with carnivores. After a kill, they drink. It's the taste of blood, you know. What was the brute like? he asked. Would you know him again? He glanced about us, standing astride over the mess of dead rabbit, his eyes roving among the shadows and screens of greenery and lurking the lurking places and ambuscades of the forest that bounded us in. The taste of blood, he said again. He took out his revolver, examined the cartridges in it, and replaced it. Then he began to pull at his dropping lip. I think I should know the brute again. I stunned him. He ought to have a handsome bruise on the forehead of him. But when we have to prove, but then we have to prove he killed the rabbit, said Montgomery. I wish I'd never brought the things here. I should have gone on, but he stayed there thinking over the mangled rabbit in a puzzle-headed way. As it was, I went to such a distance that the rabbit's remains were hidden. Come on, I said. Presently he woke up and came towards me. You see, he said almost in a whisper, they are all supposed to have a fixed idea against eating anything that runs on land. If some brute has by accident tasted blood, he went on some way in, we went on some way in silence. I wonder what can have happened, he said to himself. Then, after a pause again, I did a foolish thing the other day. That servant of mine, I showed him how to skin and cook a rabbit. It's odd. I saw him licking his hands. It never occurred to me. Then, we must put a stop to this. I must tell Moreau. He could think of nothing else on our homeward journey. Moreau took the matter even more seriously than Montgomery, and I need scarcely say I was infected by their evident consternation. We must make an example, said Moreau. I have no doubt in my own mind that the leopard man was the sinner. But now, but how can we prove it? I wish, Montgomery, you had kept your taste for meat in hand and gone without these exciting novelties. We may find ourselves in a mess yet through it. I was a silly ass, said Montgomery, but the thing's done now, and you said I might have them, you know. We must see to the thing at once, said Moreau. I suppose if anything should turn up, Mling can take care of himself. I'm not so sure of Mling, said Montgomery. I think I ought to know him. In the afternoon, Moreau, Montgomery, myself, and Mling went across the island to the huts in the ravine. We three were armed. Mling carried the little hatchet he used in chopping firewood and some coils of wire. Moreau had a huge cowherd's horn slung over his shoulder. You will see a gathering of the beast people, said Montgomery. It's a pretty sight, Moreau said, not a word on the way, but his heavy white fringed face was grimly set. We crossed the ravine, down which smoked the stream of hot water, and followed the winding pathway through the cane breaks until we reached a wide area covered over with a thick powdery yellow substance which I believed was sulfur. Above the shoulder of a weedy bank, the sea glittered. We came to a kind of shallow natural amphitheater, and here the four of us halted. Then Moreau sounded the horn and broke the sleeping stillness of the tropical afternoon. He must have had strong lungs. The hooting note rose and rose amidst its echoes to at last an ear-penetrating intensity. Ah, said Moreau, letting the curved instrument fall to his side again. Immediately there was a crashing through the yellow canes, and a sound of voices from the dense green jungle that marked the morass through which I had run on the previous day. Then all three, then at three or four points, on the edge of the sulphurous area appeared the grotesque forms of the beast people, hurrying towards us. I could not help creep a creeping horror as I perceived first one and then another trot out from the trees or reeds. 
and come shambling along over the hot dust. But Moreau and Montgomery stood calmly enough, and perforce I, struck I stuck beside them. First to arrive was the satyr, strangely unreal for all that he cast a shadow, and tossed the dust with his hoofs. After him, from the brake came a monstrous lout, a thing of horse and rhinoceros, chewing a straw as it came and then appeared the swine-woman and two wolf-women, then the fox-bear witch, with her red eyes and her peaked red face, and then others, all hurrying eagerly. As they came forward, they began to cringe towards Moreau, and chant, quite regardless of one another, fragments of the latter half of the litany of the law. His is the hand that wounds, his is the hand that heals, and so forth. As soon as they had approached within a distance of perhaps thirty yards, they halted, and bowing on knees and elbows, began flinging the white dust upon their heads. Imagine the scene if you can. We three blue-clad men, with our misshapen black-faced attendant, standing in a wide expanse of sunlit yellow dust under the blazing blue sky, and surrounded by this circle of crouching and gesticulating monstrosities, some almost human, save in their subtle expression and gestures, some like cripples, some so strangely distorted as to resemble nothing but the denizens of our wildest dreams, and beyond the reedy lines of a cane break in one direction and a dense tangle of palm trees on the other, separating us from the ravine with the huts, and to the north, the hazy horizon of the Pacific Ocean. Sixty-two, sixty-three, counted Moreau. There are four more. I do not see the leopard man, said I. Presently Moreau sounded the great horn again, and at the sound of it all the beast people writhed and groveled in the dust. Then, slinking out of the cane break, stooping near the ground, and trying to join the dust-throwing circle behind Moreau's back, came the leopard man. And I saw that his forehead was bruised, the last of the beast people to arrive was the little ape man. The earlier animals, hot and weary with their groveling, shot vicious glances at him. Cease, said Moreau, in his firm, loud voice, and the beast people sat back upon their hand, hams and rested from their worshipping. Where is the sayer of the law, said Moreau, and the hairy gray monster bowed his face in the dust. Say the words said Moreau, and forthwith all in the kneeling assembly, swaying from side to side and dashing up the sulphur with their hands, first the right hand and a puff of dust, and then the left began once more to chant their strange litany. When they reached not to eat flesh or fish, that is the law, Moreau held up his lank white hand. Stop, he cried, and there fell absolute silence upon them all. I think they all knew and dreaded what was coming. I looked round at their strange faces. When I saw their wincing attitudes and the furtive dread in their bright eyes, I wondered that I had ever believed them to be men. That law has been broken, said Moreau. None escape from the faceless creature with the silvery hair. None escape, repeated the kneeling circle of beast people. Who is he? cried Moreau and looked round at their faces, cracking his whip. I fancied the hyena swine looked dejected. So too did the leopard man. Moreau stopped facing this creature, who cringed towards him with the memory and, and dread of infinite torment. Who is he? repeated Moreau, in a voice of thunder. Evil is he who breaks the law, chanted the sayer of the law. Moreau looked into the eyes of the leopard man and seemed to be dragging the very soul out of the creature. Who breaks the law? said Moreau, taking his eyes off his victim and turning towards us. It seemed to me there was a touch of exultation in his voice. Goes back to the house of pain, they all clamored. Goes back to the house of pain, O master. Back to the house of pain. Back to the house of pain gabbled the ape man, as though the idea was sweet to him. Do you hear? said Moreau, turning back to the criminal. My friend, 
Hello. For the leopard man, released from Moreau's eye, had risen straight from his knees and now, with eyes aflame, and his huge feline tusks flashing out from under his curling lips, leapt towards his tormentor. I am convinced that only the madness of unendurable fear could have prompted this attack. The whole circle of threescore monsters seemed to rise about us. I drew my revolver. The two figures collided. I saw Moreau reeling back from the leopard man's blow. There was a furious yelling and howling all about us. Everyone was moving rapidly for a moment. I thought it was a general revolt. The furious face of the leopard man flashed in mine, with Mling close in pursuit. I saw the yellow eyes of the hyena swine, blazing with excitement his attitude as if he were half resolved to attack me. The satyr, too, glared at me over the hyena swine's hunched shoulders. I heard the crack of Moreau's pistol and saw the pink flash dart across the tumult. I saw and saw the pink flash dart across the tumult. The whole crowd seemed to swing round in the direction of the glint of fire, and I, too, was swung round by the magnetism of the movement. In another second I was running, one of a tumultuous shouting crowd in pursuit of the escaping leopard man. That is all I can tell definitely. I saw the leopard man strike Moreau, and then everything spun about me until I was running headlong. Mling was ahead, close in pursuit of the fugitive. Behind their tongues, already lolling out, ran the wolf women in great leaping strides. The swine folk followed, squealing with excitement, and the two bull men, with their swathings of white, then came Moreau in a cluster of the beast people, his wide-brimmed straw hat blown off, his revolver in hand, and his lank white hair streaming out. The hyena swine ran beside me, keeping pace with me, and glancing furtively at me out of his feline eyes, and the others came pattering and shouting behind us. The leopard man went bursting his way through the long canes, which sprang back as he passed and rattled in Mling's face. The others in the rear found a trampled path for us when we reached the break. The chase lay through the break for perhaps a quarter of a mile, and then plunged into a dense thicket that retarded our movements exceedingly, though we went through it in a crowd together, fronds flicking into our faces, ropey creepers catching us under the chin or gripping our ankles, thorny plants hooking into the tearing cloth, hooking into and tearing cloth and flesh together, he has gone on all fours through this, panted Moreau, just now just ahead of me. None escape, said the wolf bear, laughing into my face with the exultation of hunting. We burst out again among rocks and saw the quarry ahead, running lightly on all fours and snarling at us over his shoulder. At that, the wolf folk howled with delight. The thing was still clothed, and at a distance its face seemed human but the carriage of its four limbs was feline, and the furtive droop of its shoulder was distinctly that of a hunted animal. It leapt over some thorny yellow flowering bushes and was hidden. Mling was halfway across the space. Most of us now had lost the first speed of the chase and had fallen into a longer and steadier stride. I saw, as we traversed the open, that the pursuit was now spreading from a column into a line, the hyena swine still ran close to me, watching me as it ran, every now and then puckering its muzzle with a snarling laugh. At the edge of the rocks, the leopard man, realizing he was making for the projecting cape upon which he had stalked me on the night of my arrival, had doubled in the undergrowth, but Montgomery had seen the maneuver and turned him again. So, panting, tumbling against rocks, torn by brambles, impeded by ferns and reeds, I helped to pursue the leopard man who had broken the law, and the hyena swine ran, laughing savagely by my side. I staggered on, my head reeling, and my heart beating against my ribs. Tired almost to death, and yet not daring to lose sight of the chase, lest I should be left alone with this horrible companion, I staggered on in spite of infinite fatigue and the dense heat of the tropical afternoon. And at last, the fury of the hunt slackened, we had pinned the wretched brute into a corner of the island. Moreau, whip in hand, marshaled us all into an irregular line, and we advanced now slowly, shouting to one another as we advanced, 
and tightening the cordon about our victim. He lurked noiseless and invisible in the bushes through which I had run from him during that midnight pursuit. Steady, cried Moreau, steady, as the ends of the line crept round the tangle of undergrowth and hemmed the brute in. Where a rush came the voice of Montgomery from beyond the thicket? I was on the slope above the bushes. Montgomery and Moreau beat along the beach beneath. Slowly we pushed in among the fretted network of branches and leaves. The quarry was silent. Back to the house of pain! Back to the house of pain! The house of pain! yelped the voice of the ape-man some twenty yards to the right. When I heard that, I forgave the poor wretch all the fear he had inspired in me. I heard the twigs snap and the boughs swish aside before the heavy tread of the horse rhinoceros upon my right. Then suddenly, through a polygon of green, in the half-darkness under the luxuriant growth, I saw the creature we were hunting. I halted. He was crouched together into the smallest possible compass. His luminous green eyes turned over his shoulder, regarding me. It may seem a strange contradiction in me. I cannot explain the fact, but now, seeing the creature there in a perfectly animal attitude, with the light gleaming in its eyes, and its imperfectly human face distorted with terror, I realized again the fact of its humanity. In another moment, other of its pursuers would see it, and it would be overpowered and captured to experience once more the horrible tortures of the enclosure. Abruptly, I slipped out my revolver, aimed between its terror-struck eyes, and fired. As I did so, the hyena swine saw the thing and flung itself upon it with an eager cry, thrusting thirsty teeth into its neck. All about me the green masses of the thicket were swaying and cracking as the beast people came rushing together. One face, and then another, appeared. "'Don't kill it, Prendick!' cried Moreau. "'Don't kill it!' And I saw him stooping as he pushed through the, the underfronds of the big ferns. In another moment he had beaten off the hyena swine with the handle of his whip, and he and Montgomery were keeping away the excited carnivorous beast people, and particularly Mling from the still quivering body. The hairy gray thing came sniffing at the corpse under my arm, the other animals, in their animal ardor, jostled me to get a nearer view. Confound you, Prendick, said Moreau. I wanted him. I'm sorry, said I, though I was not. It was the impulse of the moment. I felt sick with exertion and excitement. Turning, I pushed my way out of the crowding beast people and went on alone up the slope towards the higher part of the headland. Under the shouted instructions of Moreau, I heard the three white-swathed bullmen begin dragging the victim down towards the water. It was easy now for me to be alone. The beast people manifested a quite human curiosity about the dead body and followed it in a thick knot, sniffing and growling at it as the bullmen dragged it down the beach. I went to the headland and watched the bullmen back against the evening sky as they carried the weighted dead body out to sea, and, like a wave across my mind, came the realization that the unspeakable aimlessness of things upon the island, the unspeakable aimlessness of things upon the, the island. Upon the beach, among the rocks beneath me, were the ape-man, the hyena swine, and several other of the beast people standing about Montgomery and Moreau. They were all intensely excited and all overflowing with noisy expressions of their loyalty to the law. Yet I felt an absolute assurance in my own mind that the hyena swine was implicated in the rabbit killing. A strange persuasion came upon me that save for the grossness of the line, the grotesqueness of all of the forms, I had here before me the whole balance of human life in miniature, the whole interplay of instinct, reason, and fate in its simplest form. The leopard man had happened to go under. That was all the difference. Poor brutes, I began to see the viler aspect of Moreau's cruelty. I had not thought before of the pain and trouble that came to these poor victims after they had passed from Moreau's hands. I had shivered only at the days of actual torment in the enclosure. 
but now that seemed to the lesser part. Before they had been beasts, their instincts fitly adapted. Before they had been beasts, their instincts fitly adapted to their surroundings and happy as living things may be. Now they stumbled in the shackles of humanity, lived in fear that never died, fretted by a law they could not understand. Their mock human existence began in an agony, was one long internal struggle, one long dread of Moreau. And for what? It was the wantonness that stirred me. Had Moreau had any intelligible object, I could have sympathized at least a little with him. I am not so squeamish about pain as that. I could have forgiven him a little even had his motive been hate. But he was so irresponsible, so utterly careless. His curiosity, his mad, aimless investigations drove him on. And the things were thrown out to live a year or so, to struggle and blunder and suffer, at last to die painfully. They were wretched in themselves. The old animal hate moved them to trouble one another. The law held them back from a brief, hot struggle and a decisive end of their natural animosities. In those days, my fear of the beast people went the way of my personal fear for Moreau. I fell, indeed, into the morbid state, deep and enduring alien to fear, which has left permanent scars upon my mind. I must confess I lost faith in the sanity of the world when I saw it suffering the painful disorder of this island. A blind fate, a vast pitiless mechanism, seemed to cut the shape cut and shape the fabric of existence, and I, Moreau, by his passion for research, Montgomery, by his passion for drink, the beast people with their instincts and mental restrictions, were torn and crushed ruthlessly, inevitably, amid the infinite complexity of its incessant wheels. But this condition did not come all at once. I think, indeed, that I anticipate a little in speaking of it now.